Hey, Rodrigo, thanks for being here. This is really, really great. Um, maybe we can just start by you introing yourself for a second and I can get organized. So quickly about myself, I've been with Point9 for the last three years. For those who... You need to explain what Point9 is. Maybe. Exactly, I will start with that. For those who maybe don't know Point9, we are a real estate investor based in Berlin, $150 million under, man under management, invested in some, some great successes in Berlin early on, like Delivery Hero, Fiverr, among others. Quite focused on, on B2B SaaS, that makes something like 50-60% of what we invest on and the other 40% or around 40% is mostly marketplaces. And quite recently spending quite a lot of time myself looking at machine learning, artificial intelligence companies. I've been a CTO before moving into the investment side, so I'm quite geeky as Gabriel mentioned before. And I'm the one who tends to spend time on those kind of things. So, so I mean, the, t the title of, of, of what we're doing here, and, and you know, before we get going discussing between the two of us, uh, let's make this as interactive as possible, right? So if you have questions in between, raise your hand. You know, this is not, this is seriously not us talking. But before we, we, we get to investing in AI, what are VCs, VCs looking for in startups, um, maybe just one more word on, on Fly Ventures. Um, because like up to now, I think I was always running this as sort of a private person, and now we're combining Gabriel, the private person, with Fly, and we are pretty new uh, seed stage venture capital fund um, based here in Berlin. Um, we are uh, happy co-investors actually in a bunch of companies with point nine, point nine already. Um, we are, this is our beautiful logo, and if I wasn't so disorganized, I would be able to do this while I'm speaking, but I'm male, so I cannot. Um, what we do um, is, is that we are thematically focused on, on, you know, we call it an automation with a focus on machine learning, um, marketplaces and SaaS, so like very closely to, to some of the things we're talking about today. And it's also, um, and it's also, you know, for us in terms of stage, we're also a very early stage investor, right? So we typically invest in seed. Um, well, I guess my time is up. It's bad. Um, so we also invest in seed across Europe, so typically 250 to like 750,000 euros in initial rounds, if this is at all exciting for you. So um, something that I really liked uh, when I was doing some, some prep for our talk here, um, I, I was reading your predictions for 2016, and you said that AI is the new teenage sex. Can you explain why AI is the new teenage sex? So Every time there is a, a new technology coming into the market, something cool, and think about like drones, blockchain, now machine learning, artificial intelligence, like every time there is something, there is a lot of hype around that. And in that specific topic I was mentioning, like big data was this uh, teenage tech sex, which means basically that everyone is speaking about it, but not that many people has done it. And that's a bit of the case, I think, around machine learning. And I think almost for sure is the case around artificial intelligence. So we see some early cases, mostly like correlations rather than machine learning and trying to find what kinds of data are related with others. And I think, in my opinion, and that was written almost a year ago, artificial intelligence, there is still a, a long path to get there. So, so something that you said, and, and to some degree this is, you know, I, I would say it's true for what we are seeing. You said machine learning will be part of every pitch we will see. Um, most of the time the value provided by ML will be limited. And yes, to be honest, dear entrepreneurs, you know, you know, putting the word ML next to something that has nothing to do with machine learning is not like it makes you so much more attractive. We are pretty dumb, but not that dumb. Um, I mean, we as in the investor <laughs> side. But, but the other thing that you said is um, that, that you were projecting, you know, AI not becoming mainstream, and there's some like early successes, and, and people have been reading about these. Um, so, you know, if we focus on some of the early, you know, the early stuff that went through the media, like a deep mind that got acquired by Google, or, or more, more recently, um, a magic pony that was sold to Twitter for something like 150 million or so. What are these, I mean, what, what, are, what is the ingredients that you see in these companies that, you know, maybe if you're an entrepreneur here, um, you know, you have something to learn from where, what are these companies doing right? Wh what's so exciting about them? So, I think Google has been doing machine learning for long, right? Like when I was seeing the previous demo at the beginning, I thought, but this looks pretty similar to Google News, right? Like clustering news and trying to show you what are the most relevant stories that you should be aware. But 
apparently, and I don't know them, unfortunately, the guys at, at, Deep, at Deep Mind are exceptional in the sense of not even at the scale of Google, you can find people who are so deep understanding what you can do with these kind of tools that are today in the market. And that's the scarce resource today. People that are exceptionally good at understanding machine learning and being able to go to the next level of deep learning and being able to even go to the next level, which I yet I'm not able to call it, but who knows what comes after. But I think like the very scarce resource today the same way that maybe like a couple of years ago it was data science people is today experts in artificial intelligence. So if you build something extremely technical that can prove that your understanding of the, of the processes and the technology sets you 10 times better at the scale that Google can do it, then you can become a very valuable company. But that's a very technical problem. It's more an R&D kind of setting than the kind of investment that most of us are investing, which is more building businesses rather than building, building R&D projects. So, so would you say that you know, for those who are in doing something in this space, uh, the best thing to do is, is you know, like what you did to team up with, you know, help people coming deep, deep, deep from research? Is that, is a one, that one of the implications? Yeah, exactly. Like basically, the examples we have seen so far are mostly business applications of the, not I will not say platforms, right, but the tools that are out there to, that allow you to apply machine learning or that they allow you to apply deep learning, you apply them to a business case where you usually need to have someone who knows what's the business problem that you are trying to solve. And because you apply this technology to a business problem, then you have an output that is 10 times better than whatever is in the market. This is one way to build a valuable company. The other way could be like if you are so experienced in this space or you are so deep or you are basically so smart and you're able to build something that technology is extremely impossible for everyone else to do, then you might have something valuable. But that basically requires you to not even use any of the frameworks out there. Like basically build your own things that are going to be 10 times better than Google. So just, just to you know, make sure that we do stuff that's kind of valuable to, to you guys, who here is like an entrepreneur building a company that if you were to send Rodrigo a pitch would have the word AI or ML in that deck? Come on, now you don't have to be shy. This cannot be true that it's one person. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right, prediction, it's not going mainstream. <laughs> maybe you are very right. Or maybe you're just a bit too shy. Um, but if you, you know, if you turn around what you just said, what does that mean in terms of what you are looking for in companies um, that uh, you know that that happen to you know to, to claim or be you know heavy ML companies? What what's, what what are sort of the evaluation criteria you use? So initially, I'm thinking, can they provide value even if machine learning doesn't work? Because the expectation is almost all the time that machine learning is going to work but I see a significant technology risk, right? And we invest pretty early. In some cases, I think like out of the investments I've done in the last three years, a third of them didn't generate revenues when we invested. So there is still a big risk that they might not be able to build the product that they are promising. And because I understand the risk that comes with building those machine learning tools, I'm looking for companies that can provide value without the machine learning really working. Like, I don't know, if I pick the example of Parlamine, even if the classification of the tickets doesn't work at a perfect scale or a perfect level of accuracy, you still can have this dashboard that brings value to the customers, right? So that allows you to have a strategy to start growing your customers, start charging them, get more data, and the more data that you get, the more you can train your algorithm, and then with that algorithm and better accuracy, you can build more value through the machine learning. So basically, if I summarize, is start building something that can build can provide value to the end customer without the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm, get somehow a way to attract data from those customers or get somehow a way to attract valuable data, retrain, keep retraining your algorithms, and, later, and for sure keep increasing your prices because as soon as this value is coming from the machine learning, then you are building something that is extremely valuable. So something that you guys at Point9 are doing a lot and you personally are doing is that you are you know, trying to ex be very explicit about the kind of things you're looking for, right? I think you know, when we were, we were entrepreneurs, one of the things we all hated in venture capital was that we, it was okay to get to know, but it kind of sucked to get to know and not to understand why. And it's much easier to understand that if, if you have a sense for what, what that person next to you is you know, actually looking for. So you know, somewhat connected, 
and, and this is far from perfect, don't take pictures because I'm gonna be ashamed when you pull this out later, but this is just something that we at Fly are using, um, again, you know, just trying to make this tangible for you, that we are using in terms of when we look at companies that are, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry if this is, if you can read it, I hope you can, but it's sort of three steps, right? Step one is, um, you know, the, the, we're just technology-wise, we're not there yet. By the way, guys, if you want to take a more comfy seat, there's like two premium, super awesome seats right here. It's like, I know the floor is nice, but this could be even better. Um, so, so something that we always look for is like, is, there, uh, is someone focusing on something that's fairly routine, fairly clearly defined, is there a clear target function? Because this like general artificial intelligence, obviously we know we are far away from it, but you know, long before we have like something that can do everything, even like super broad applications from what we're seeing, it's just, it's just super hard, right? I think the, yeah, something like a deep mind probably stands out because I think almost none of these apply because they are like, I would classify them as like, they're like almost like research institutes, right? They just have, apply smart people to different sets of problems and then hope for being acquired early. Yeah. It's kind of hard, like I, I at least find it hard to make these kind of investments. If you have one of these companies, you can also speak to us, that's okay though. <laughs> but, but is that, how does that work for you? So again, these are in the investments. First of all, I think the, the level of understanding from the point of view of the investor of like what sets apart this team from the others, it's super hard. Like I can understand the principles of machine learning and I can understand what are the principles of building machine learning on top of a SaaS business, but I'm completely unable to understand if those guys are building something that Google cannot do. So when I look at those teams that are approaching general problems and trying to apply like machine learning a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, and they are kind of making proof of concept of the technology, it's, it's hard, right? Like, I, I cannot evaluate this kind of business, and if I cannot evaluate it, then I cannot get the confidence to push to make an investment. So those are cases that are a lot harder for us to evaluate. But on the other side, those cases where we see clear business value, where we see that you can build something that you can sell to a customer, that's a lot easier to understand. I can understand how you are building the product, I can understand the high level principles, and I can speak with your potential customers. And if your potential customers tell me, wow, this is saving me, I don't know, in the case of Parlamine, is it saving 10 people we have in a team that is only going through tickets and classifying them? And with this machine, I can put these 10 people to do something more valuable. Amazing, I can understand. And you, you guys have made some investments in that, in that larger space, right? In different, can you maybe explain two or three just to, to make yeah. this tangible? So high level we've done investments in areas where, where you, like basically in machine learning there is this super bias and super bias and it's all about having this feedback loop, right? So you have data, this data goes through an algorithm and the algorithm tries to make a prediction, similar to the Titanic example we saw before. So in our portfolio, Credit Tech, you might have heard of them, they apply this same process to lending decisions. So you come to Credit Tech website, you ask for a loan, they take all the data about you, like I, that's all data, so I don't know if today they do it that way, but initially they checked, did this guy read the terms and conditions before asking for the loan? They didn't read the terms and conditions, it's kind of a tricky situation. How, how many friends do they have in Facebook? Are they replying quickly or not to their friends? So those kind of data points to decide if they lend you money or not. This is one example, right? Like, and Craytech was facing the risk of, of those investments going wrong because they didn't have any data set to train their own algorithm. They had to build the algorithm but by doing mistakes. And that might take a lot of money, so that's why at this specific example, it was valuable that they were lending small amounts of money. And again, like, think about this, this principle of where is the data coming from? Do you acquire the data from a third party or from your potential customers or you build it yourself? Because that's going to define how quickly can you prove to the investor that you have something valuable. Then the other cases, another is uh, Candies where we are working together. It is more an, an automated accounting solution, and they they sit on top of your of your invoices through your email, and they try to do the bookkeeping on your end. And in this, that specific case, it's more similar to the Sasco company, in which you have a lot of data that your customers are providing you. They process that data and they try to do your bookkeeping. I, I, you know, from these two cases and, and something that I was, you know, going towards when we, you know, started looking at this slide together, um, and you had mentioned this before, 
I think the tricky piece for us is if, if we look into these kind of companies and we evaluate them, is that you're looking for a combination. You're looking for a combination of somebody who's able to build a product that gets initial usage, which, by the way, in a way, right, has zero to do with ML, right? This is back to pure getting to early or some degree of product market fit just to get usage into a product. So uh, there's a bunch of teams, you know, sometimes more in the UK maybe right now than, than in Germany, where you have, you know, two Cambridge PhD guys, super brilliant, and, and it's really, you know, the, the, the solution looking for a problem. They, they can do all crazy things, but they haven't built a simple product that somebody starts using. And then you need that, and then you apply some of, some, some of that, call it ML magic, and, and what we have on, you know, what it says on, on the right there, um, this virtual flywheel of data network effect, that's something we are at least using internally. And again, you know, I'm sure it's far from perfect as a definition, but for us, um, the thought or the question was, okay, what's going to be defensive, what, what is defensibility going to be in, in, a, in a world where, um, you know, maybe the, the, you know, the, the whole algorithmic side is probably not going to be differentiating, right? I mean, you, you were mentioning, right, that in your company, um, your co-founders are still heavily in research. And the majority of people you can hire in data science, part of hiring them is allowing them to continue to publish, which means there's very little super secret source of things that only you can do. And relying on something like that, or maybe as a hint, again, to make this tangible, you know, coming to an investor meeting and being like, I have the two best people in the world and only we can do that, it's just, you know, it's possible, but let's say it's unlikely. And it's certainly unlikely that you have this indefinitely, like over a long period of time. So what we're looking for when we think about defensibility, right, you building a company that, you know, can survive a very large company maybe jumping, you know, onto that once they see that you're successful, is that you have an initial product that generates value for people, that creates more data, that improves your product, that generates more data, that improves your product. That's the flywheel. So, I mean, that's just, you know, I, say, I, I know it's fairly theoretic, but you know, if it was concrete, then the two of us would not be schmuck VCs, but we would be building companies, right? So, that's all we can do. Um, all right, enough of theoretic talk. Please, please be brutal and grill us and ask whatever you want to ask. Really, don't be shy. Do we have a mic? Do we have another mic? Hello. People with the microphone. That was too boring and they left. Yes. That's okay. You know, the, the demos were exciting, but we got people to sleep after 14 minutes. So um, you're saying here, uh, show value early and quickly, but at the same time you're saying, okay, um, data network effects. And don't you think that it's a bit of a inconsistency to say, um, I want early value, but then I want something that relies on network effects because obviously accomplishing both at the same time is extremely difficult. Take Parlamine as an example, as we were describing, right? Like the initial value is they plug into your data if you're an e-commerce company and they tell you what kind of, we, even without classifying, they could show you volumes of tickets, right? Like if you see which days of the week you get more, like basically an advanced reporting that tells you which days of the week you get more tickets or timing or like whatever analytics that are basic doesn't require any machine learning, which means you are providing value quickly and your customers might be happy. Then you start classifying those tickets with machine learning. And then the more data you put into the machine learning, the better you can classify those tickets. So it's basically, you started early providing value by doing this dashboard, you started having a smart way to collect data, you add more value by using that data to have a better algorithm, and the more, they, the more value you add, more customers you can bring, and basically you can generate this network effect. But it's, to it's totally fine to start with, with a you know, large N equals one, two, three, four customers, right? The point is not to be, I, I think sometimes people, because we've heard this word network effect so much, people always think like, oh yeah, network effect, I understand that, telephone and Twitter. This is not what we're talking about here, right? This is not, not a network effect in a, like, in a communication tool. It's purely meant on the data that you generate from doing the, you know, uh, someone having the initial, using the initial product, which improves the product, which leads to more people, which improves the product, right? But you can start really small. So who, who is 
familiar with what's the meaning of network effects. Could you raise your hand? Okay, so if it helps, a quick refresher on what does it mean is like, you think about eBay, for example, the more people are going into eBay as a buyer, the more value there is for the supply, right? Because you have more potential customers. And for the demand, the more supply you have, the more value exists for the demand, right? Because I have more choices. And it means basically every supply you add, it adds value for the potential demand, which means that you will add more demand. And there is this, this uh, snowball effect that basically means, means that eBay is going to be unbreakable. And that's a bit of what might happen with the data, right? Like if I'm the one who has the best algorithm at classifying the tickets, I will get more companies to share their tickets, I will tag better those tickets, and basically I have a snowball effect that makes it very hard for someone who tries to get in. So that's the basic principle that we are looking when we look at, at those kind of examples. There was a question over there. Uh, yeah, two related questions. Uh, what do you think are some of the most interesting uh, examples of machine learning in the e-commerce field, like startups? And related to that, uh, do you know Stitch Fix from America? And uh, do you know any more like startups who have achieved like that 99% being able to predict if somebody is going to, to buy that shirt or to keep that pants? Uh, I don't know, I, I remember uh, the name but or sounds familiar, but I don't know much of what they do. But I've seen like in a couple of the events we've done, we have had the, the guys at machine learning at Amazon, which again, like at the scale of data that they have, they can basically do whatever they want in terms of e-commerce. And it's incredible, like, like the recommendations, like showing you exactly, the, like one example is about the comments, right? They have a huge amount of comments in every single product. If they will need to, review those comments manually to see if there is something fraudulent there. It will take them like the whole humanity reading comments of products of Amazon, right? So at the moment, machine learning allows them to pick the ones that are correct and remove the ones that are not relevant. Then about the recommender engine, it's like people who bought, who bought this product, they also buy these ones. All those things are powered by machine learning and at the scale of data that they have, they can do things that are unimaginable. But just another example that it's not so related with e-commerce, but I think is one of the most exciting things that, that I'm focusing at the moment is when you're buying a bunch of things in Amazon, you probably have seen those robots that Amazon has at the warehouses, that they go to the right uh, storage layer and they pick all your products. So imagine that you order, I don't know, like a, one book and, I don't know, and a Kindle and, and, and I don't know, another issue, right? And these, machine, these robots go, they pick the, item, the items, they put them in the same package. Those robots can make mistakes. So the way Amazon is today making sure that those robots didn't make mistakes is they have a camera that is checking what's the content of this specific package, and they recognize the objects there and make sure that if they are supposed to be there, they are there. Which basically removes the need for manual supervision of, of the packaging. And that's like huge improvement in terms of, of, of time spent into that process, a lot res less orders return, but it's pretty amazing what they can do based on image recognition, right? So, so just quickly, because you asked you know, more e-commerce related stuff, I think f from what we are seeing, there's a lot of, I would call it like enabling companies around e-commerce companies, right? I mean, what Parliament is doing is, is vital for e-commerce, right? Because one of the things that you spend a lot of time on is all the, all the requests you get. Um, I'm not sure you mean this direction because in a way, right, the, the, the industry that's probably most advanced in doing a lot of these things is, you know, I think, look at the people that Criteo or so has hired, right? I mean, predicting what people will buy based on display ads is probably they're probably the most advanced and they probably also have the largest data asset in this just because they can, I mean, they can listen to your activity on a bunch of sites, not only your own website. So for me, for what we're seeing, it's, it's more a lot of like enabling services around e-commerce. It's not, it's at least to, to what I've seen, not something that's like on-site e-commerce, anything specific. Other questions back there? Yeah, so uh, coming back to your like, uh, network uh, effects thing. Uh, so you say it's uh, like advantageous for you like, to like, build this product which is, has like acquiring this data at first, 
but like how does this guarantee you like or your company from not a bigger company come like collecting the same amount of data uh, much quicker and like just overtaking you you know this is only an example it's not the only way to build a, a long-term sustainable business and it's also very dependent on the data you acquire like for example when have you seen the the example of nvidia doing automated cars so to do google automated car they probably like i don't remember how many hours did they drive the cars on the street nvidia at the moment with 100 hours of driving the car manually they can make an automated car i mean obviously all the edge cases they are not able to cover it but with 100 hours of driving they can make an automated car this is extremely impressive and i think that's the issue right when we are looking at those network effects we need to understand if that data is going to be valuable in the long run because if and one like high level thesis that i have around this topic is to be valuable in the long run this data needs to be data that goes quickly outdated because if it doesn't get outdated then probably those other guys will also be able to acquire the same amount of historical data and it needs to be something that is business valuable and ideally it should be private data so if you have these three things it makes it pretty hard even for the largest company to try to build a product on this specific asset and I, and I think adding to that i think you know for a long time people would have made that you know if, i'm sure there's a lot of people when you know would have you would have showed them that you're building a you know a chat client on mobile or a picture a picture client called instagram you know next to some of these large large companies with all these users it seemed like impossible to do that and i think I know this is like super scary, thin to make that analogy, but to try to go that way, I think the the opportunity you have if you start companies like this is, you know, it's, it's like being super, super narrow in, in what you do, like super specific, right? It's not like people said, oh, I'm going to recreate a social network based on mobile. No, 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 no. They picked like a very, very super specific angle and then bid that out. And then they created a network effect on that. That was actually... You know, again, it's it's kind of difficult to replicate the WhatsApp. I agree, but but it is if if you can if you can manage to get in strong usage on something like that, you can build stuff that is you know defensible. Um, so so maybe in contrast to you know a lot of people you know when you read read the Spiegel or so the the, the idea is that Google and Facebook will just like take this entire world and dominate. And there are areas where this is true, but uh, I think there's going to be a lot, a lot of opportunity for you guys to, you know, pick areas where they will not do that. There's another question here, or there. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you talked about Google, who has been doing machine learning for uh, years or decades, and you talked also about Quidio. Um, I, I used to work at, at Quidio, and you're right, they're pretty good. Uh, however, uh, at some point, when you start to be very good, um, you cannot improve that much. And do you feel, as an investor, that we might get close to a point of diminishing return in ML? In, in which area, or like broadly speaking? In recommendations, predictions. I think there is so, so many topics where still like we don't have any data to make predictions that just capturing the data changes the game. Like think how, still how many people are spending their day with a piece of paper and trying to take numbers that then someone else is like, I don't know if it's still the case today, but this is an example that was super scary when I learned it. So in the mutual fund industry, when your pension fund decides that they want to buy, I don't know, 10 million dollars of, uh, of shares of Fidelity, whatever, the order to buy 10 million dollars was in fax. So we are so, so far from getting diminishing returns on, on many, many industries. It can get harder to get deeper into marketing spaces, which are highly digital with many data sources that you can make a lot of decisions. But still, like even when it sounds that it can get impossible to, to keep progressing, then maybe a new platform comes in. And it was mobile, and initially Credeo was not mobile first company, and then it opens an opportunity. Then maybe it's VR, and there is a new opportunity. So even in the cases that look saturated, I think there is high chances to, to keep innovating. I would also, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. I think we're far, far, far away. 
to be honest, I think given, you know, to give you a different perspective on this, if we look into the kind of opportunities that we're seeing that, you know, that we can invest in today, I think the, the, the majority of companies that have been acquired and also a lot of the money that has been spent is, is like in or around really like still enabling tech stuff, right? We're just starting to see things, you know, hmm, people applying this in insurance, okay? Or what does that mean? Right? There's an interesting uh, French company, right, called Shift that just, you know, started doing this just uncovering insurance fraud. Um, so, you know, uh, to me, I feel like, you know, if, if an Allianz or Munich Re cannot do this and needs to find companies like this, then you can see that, you know, it's really like on these S curve, it's like a huge, entirely new curve. And I, my feeling is we're at like point, you know, at 1% of, of, of where we can go. All right, last question before everybody has left the room and we, keep, we are the last two ones sitting here. Um, in the context of uh, you uh, listen a, a lot of people uh, so in their, uh, their idea or their business, uh, which is the most common or maybe your favorite mistakes that uh, the entrepreneur is doing when they do a pitch uh, for you? It's always easy to go first. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's like, for me at least, there's not like the one mistake. I think there's, to, to be honest, I think I can, it's probably easier to reply what, what we like best, okay? I think what we like best, if, if you really sort of get rid of the word pitch and you're able to engage the other person, that is us, into a conversation, right? Because it's, it's very awkward if you, you know, if you have, maybe a bunch of people there and you feel like you're being shown this like rehearsed um, presentation. That, at least for me, for example, is like a big down, you know, turn off. Um, and I, I sometimes see it happening. I used to, in our old office, I was working for a large venture capital firm. Um, I, I, because I was a founder and I pitched mo to most VCs myself and I, I really had hated it. Um, and something that I really, realize is that a lot of people when they you know come to a vc's office they're super nervous so we, we had we had this collection of like tech tools uh tech like uh, geeky things like the first ipod very early game boys or so and when i realized someone came in and they were super nervous i would always like first would play with the gadgets a bit and i don't i seriously mean this because like i would want people to relax i'm sure there's a shorter answer to your question but relax is a good one not much to add, but maybe like it's kind of a job interview, right? So the good job interviews tend to be the ones where you are the right fit for that job because your previous background was similar and because what you can convey in the message makes sense. So if you come to speak with an investor and this is the right investor for you in the sense of looking at the right stage, understanding what are they willing to invest on, and your pitch is the right one for this kind of investor, then everything is a lot more easy because then I will just be curious to keep learning about your company. You will have the answers because you are working on that on a daily basis and it's a lot more natural, the conversation, and then it gets, it gets more fluent as Gabriel was saying. Cool. That's it for, for today. Um, help us improve this. You can give us feedback via the Meetup page and, and tell us what we should do better or differently or less of or so. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, yes, enjoy whatever is left of drinks. I hope something is left. And uh, have a safe trip home. Bye-bye. Ciao.